It's four o'clock, right on the uh, Rolex watches here. Um, so, okay, uh, I, I know you, you all know why we are here today. I mean, because you, you have read the, uh, the uh, press release and, and also the, uh, the mail that was sent by the Director General this morning. So I would like maybe uh, uh, first to, uh, I mean, to recall the aim of this seminar. I mean, our, our colleagues from Opera uh, have made uh, an intriguing measurement. And uh, after, I'm sure, uh, a lot of and harsh work uh, they have done during ma many months and, and in order to, to try to pin it down or understand it, they have decided to, to make it public. And uh, I think the aim of this seminar is, is really to, uh, to, to share this with you, to show you uh, what they have done, and, and uh, of course to, to trigger uh, questions from, from your side and, and later from the community. I think this is the, main, this is the aim of this seminar. So the seminar will be uh, given by uh, uh, Dario Otiero, uh, who is from uh, Institut Physique Nucléaire de Lyon. Uh, and he is uh, currently the uh, physics uh, coordinator of the OPERA collaboration. So I let him now uh, show you the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So the spirit of this seminar was well uh, summarized by uh, Philippe. And I, I just want to add that we are very happy uh, to be at CERN today. Uh, we thank CERN for the uh, possibility that uh, was given to us to give this seminar and also for the continuous support uh, in the operation of the CNGS beam. So as you probably know, uh, uh, today I'm talking on behalf of the Opera Collaboration. Uh, this is a collaboration uh, including 160 physicists from certain institutions and 11 countries, mainly from uh, Japan and Europe. And in, uh, for this special result, uh, we also profited from the collaboration of uh, individuals and uh, institutes which worked uh, with us for various uh, uh, issues related to the metrology measurements. So I just quickly report here uh, many contributions from CERN, from the CNGS uh, group, the survey group, the timing uh, group at CERN, and the PS group. And then we got uh, a very, uh, also a very important contribution from the Geodesy Group from the uh, Università La Sapienza in Rome, the Swiss uh, Metrology Institute METAS, and the German uh, Metrology Institute uh, uh, PTB. So the, the principle of the measurement that we are going to discuss today is uh, it's quite simple. It's a classical measurement. So it's a ratio uh, among a precisely measured baseline and time of flight. So in order to measure the time of flight of neutrinos, we need uh, to tag uh, the neutrino production time, and we need to tag the neutrino interaction time uh, by a far detector, which is OPERA. The other ingredient is the accurate determination of the baseline, which comes from geodesy. And since the, the effects that we are uh, going to see are small, so we, we need a long baseline in order to uh, match the accuracy of the timing measurements. And uh, in, uh, in our case, this baseline is 730 kilometers. And then the other aspect of this measurement is that this was a blind analysis. So we opened the box after uh, uh, we reached an adequate level of understanding of the systematics. So I will just quickly go through the past experimental results. We had uh, a result uh, from uh, uh, an experiment at Fermilab in 1979, where they were uh, uh, performing this measurement on uh, high energy neutrinos with energies uh, greater than 30 GB. They tested deviations with respect to the speed of light, uh, comparing the muon uh, neutrinos and the muon velocities. And the result was that uh, these kind of deviations were less than uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 5. Then, as you all know, we have uh, the results related to the observation of the supernova uh, 1987A. In that case, uh, uh, electron antineutrinos were observed, uh, mainly from the inverse beta decay, in the 10 MeV range on a baseline of 168,000 light years, which is uh, very long. And this is a negative result, which uh, tells you uh, that there are no deviations within, uh, uh, for less than 2 times 10 to the minus 9. 
And then we had the MINOS result in 2007. This is uh, with the uh, mere neutrinos over 730 kilometers with uh, uh, the energy of neutrinos peaking at 3 GB and the tail extending above 100 GB. And in that case, the result was positive. It was 5.1 times 10 to the minus 5, although not significant because it was just 1.8 uh, sigmas. The OPER experiment was designed uh, uh, for another purpose in order to study the uh, mu neutrino to tau neutrino oscillations. So it's a detector with uh, high space accuracy in order to de detect the tau decay topology. Uh, in order to perform this study, the main uh, um, uh, sub-detector is the so-called uh, ECC brick, which is a sandwich of uh, lead plates, which are one millimeter thick and uh, uh, photographic uh, films, uh, nuclear emulsions. And this allows to detect uh, with uh, micrometric accuracy the features of the uh, tau decay. The bricks are passive uh, uh, objects, so they need uh, uh, electronic detector in order to uh, find where the neutrino interaction occurred in the target and uh, uh, also uh, reconstruct the muons which are uh, uh, typically particles crossing uh, uh, many uh, walls or bricks in, a, in our detector and also attribute a time to the neutrino interaction. So there are, uh, uh, in this figure, you see these so-called electronic trackers that we will uh, discuss also for the uh, neutrino velocity measurement. Here you can see a picture of the opera detector in Gran Sasso. So you can see the walls where the bricks are arranged. So the detector is made of uh, two super modules. Each super module includes 31 uh, uh, walls. Uh, we didn't feel completely the detector. You see that there are some uh, empty spaces. And uh, you can see the, br the bricks in, uh, in, this in this wall structure and then uh, you don't see in details, but there are uh, uh, scintillator planes in between each pair of walls. And then there is a magnetic spectrometer in order to measure the momentum of the muon and their charge. So the, the target tracker is the detector which is in between uh, uh, each pair of uh, uh, brick walls and it's a, a scintillator plane. It's a scintillator biplane with the two views. X and Y, and is made of module of scintillator strips. Here you can see one module during the construction. So uh, one module includes 64 strips uh, for a, a, a total width of 1.7 meters and a length of 6.9 meters. The strips are left with, are read out with uh, uh, wavelength shifting fibers on the two sides. And uh, these the 64 wavelength shifting fibers are then read out with a multi anode uh, photomultiplier. So, there is, uh, you can imagine that uh, for each super photomultiplier, there is a, a front end board which is associated to it on the two sides of the module. In fact, the detector, uh, the, the, the AQ system uh, works uh, uh, in a triggerless mode asynchronously by uh, putting together these uh, uh, the front-end boards, which are about 1,200. They are distributed uh, all around uh, uh, the detector. And in particular, there are 1,000 of these front-end boards for the, the readout of the scintillator planes. And the data are then output on a, a gigabit Ethernet network. So since the detector works asynchronously, a very important ing ingredient is the synchronization of all these uh, front-end boards, which is provided by a clock distribution system, which works with 10 nanosecond uh, uh, granularity, which delivers the UTC time to all the front-end boards, uh, so that then uh, the uh, its, which are uh, acquired by each front-end board, can be aligned uh, in time and the event can be reconstructed. And all this system is handled by this uh, Opera master clock, which receives a signal from an external GPS. It receives a synchronization system uh, uh, one, uh, every, once every millisecond. And this uh, Opera master clock card has a very stable uh, oscillator, which has the stability comparable to a rubidium clock, so that uh, among two synchronization, the time is kept 
with a very high accuracy. All these front-end boards, they are read out with the same concept, which is uh, the so-called mezzanine DAQ card, which includes a CPU with embedded <coughs> Linux, a memory, an FPGA, which, uh, for instance, performs the tag tagging of the event, the clock receiver, and uh, uh, the uh, circuit which puts the data on uh, Ethernet. So here you can see a, a few examples of events uh, detected by the electronic detectors of Opera. Here you have a, a new charger current interaction candidate, where you see here the point of interaction, uh, the hadronic shower, and then the muon, which is crossing the two super module. This is a neutral current event, where you ju just see the hadronic shower. And these are muons, which are coming from uh, uh, neutrino interaction occurring in the rock in front of the detector which uh, will be also be used for this measurement. So the, LNG, the CNGS beam is going from CERN uh, to uh, the Grand Sasso underground laboratory over this baseline of 730 kilometers. You can imagine that the full width, uh, half maximum of the beam in Grand Sasso is about two kilometers. And uh, in the picture, you can see also a sketch of the Grand Sasso laboratory. Uh, and uh, on top of the laboratory, you have uh, 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 an equivalent thickness, a thickness of about 1,400 uh, meters of rock, which strongly reduced the uh, rate of cosmic rays. We have an uh, underground rate of uh, uh, one muon per square meter per hour. So there is uh, about a factor of 1,000 reduction with respect to what you have uh, uh, on surface. And now I will say a few words about the CNGS uh, uh, neutrino beam. So protons are accelerated uh, up to 400 GV uh, <coughs> by the SPS. And uh, this is done on a cycle which lasts uh, six seconds. And then uh, the entire content of the SPS is extracted in two extractions, which uh, roughly correspond uh, each one to uh, five over, over 11 of the circumference of the SPS and they last 10.5 microseconds. So the extraction is performed by a kicker magnet. The two extractions are separated by 50 milliseconds. And the nominal beam intensity is 2.4 times 10 to the 13 protons per extraction. So this is a pure uh, mu neutrino beam with an average energy of the neutrinos of 17 GB, which is then sent to Grand Sasso traveling to the Earth crust. So here you can see the sketch of the beam. You have the proton line up to the target, then you have the system of the horn and the reflector in order to fo focalize the uh, positive uh, mesons, which are then sent in this uh, decay tube, which is uh, one kilometer uh, long. And then uh, there is a, an hadron stop and uh, two muon detectors at the end in order to measure uh, the profile of the muons which come uh, from the pion decay as the neutrinos. So now we, we, ca we uh, come to how we select the events related to the CNGS beam. So this is done uh, like in uh, other experiments, like in MINOS or T2K, by using the GPS system. And uh, this allows to synchronize the two sites in order to uh, uh, compare the time of production uh, of, uh, of extraction of the protons from the accelerator and CERN and the time of detection of neutrinos in Gran Sasso. So with the standard GPS systems, you have an accura typical accuracy of 100 nanoseconds. And uh, since the beginning of the data taking in Opera, we were uh, opening a window of uh, 40 microseconds, plus minus 20 uh, microseconds, where we were comparing the time of the events in Opera with respect to the time of uh, uh, the extraction of the protons from the SPS, the so-called uh, uh, t kicker plus uh, the time of flight uh, computed by assuming the speed of light. So this is a very uh, broad window, as you see, and uh, it was completely uh, matching the accuracy of the standard GPS systems uh, existing at CERN and uh, in, uh, in Gran Sasso for this kind of uh, coincidences. So here you can see uh, a picture that we published in uh, uh, 2008, I believe, in one of the first papers, uh, or 2007, one of the first papers of Opera, 
where we can see uh, the time distribution of the events recorded by opera. So this is on a very large window, plus minus 50 milliseconds, and you can see that there is a, a, a flat distribution due to the cosmic rays, but then you see the, the two neutrino spills, which are separated by 50 milliseconds. And if you zoom on the two spills, you can see a very uh, clean distribution of the events which are uh, on time uh, with the beam, uh, practically without background. In fact, you can measure the background by looking, for instance, in this region, and it is of the order of 10 to the minus uh, 4. So this selection uh, uh, procedure by opening this window of plus minus 20 microseconds, we have, been, uh, we, we have been keeping unchanged since 2006, is just a procedure in order to uh, find events which are uh, on, uh, on time with the beam. So this is another picture in, uh, uh, of a distribution uh, produced in 2008. If you apply this principle, as uh, I, I described before, you, you can see that you, you find uh, two very clean uh, distributions, uh, with, with, uh, practically without background around. But you see also that these di distributions of the uh, neutrinos, they are not flat at all. They are different uh, uh, if you compare the first and the second destruction. And uh, this is uh, uh, due to a different ti real timing of the protons with respect to this uh, uh, kicker pulse uh, trigger. So if you would just uh, attempt to measure uh, the neutrino velocity by taking the average of these two distributions and without uh, accounting for the features of the beam, you would find uh, different values for the first and the second destruction. So uh, in, uh, in uh, 2006, when we started uh, uh, this uh, work in order to uh, find the events in coincidence with the CNGS, we realized also that we could do better. And in order to do better, one has to take into account these two factors, that the uh, distribution of neutrinos is not flat, because the protons are not flat, and also this different uh, timing. So the need is to measure precisely the proton spills. The other thing that we realized is on the side of the GPS. So as I said, we were using uh, uh, standard uh, uh, commercial GPS for, uh, well, high accuracy applications, but not comparable to what you will see in a, in a few minutes. So this is a picture where uh, the two GPS which were installed uh, in Gran Sasso at the time, and they are still uh, there, are compared to a cesium uh, clock. Uh, so this is the face of these two GPS clocks with respect to the cesium. So you can see similar features. You can see that there are uh, some large oscillations of about 60 nanoseconds. You can also see that there are uh, big differences. Uh, so don't look at the absolute value of this scale, but you, you can see that there are uh, about uh, 150 nanoseconds difference on average between the two clocks because they were not uh, precisely calibrated. So the other need uh, uh, in order to go to a more precise evaluation of the neutrino velocity was to uh, have uh, something which provides an accurate time synchronization of the beam. So we uh, have been profiting of a very uh, good collaboration with the CERN timing team since 2003. Uh, this has been really fruitful and brought to this uh, measurement where we joined the techniques uh, used commonly in high energy physics and metrology techniques. And this was a, a major contribution from a, our collaborators from CERN. So together we decided in 2008 to go to a major upgrade of the timing system. And uh, uh, this upgrade allowed to uh, perform the measurement that I will, uh, uh, I will describe in a, in a few minutes. So the uh, good points of opera for this neutrino velocity measurement are the following. This is a high energy neutrino beam, which means high statistics. And uh, as you will see, the measurement is based on about uh, 16,000 events. So this gives a very good uh, uh, statistical accuracy. And then uh, the other ingredient is this sophisticated timing system, uh, which we decided to install in 2008. And this allows to reach a synchronization level uh, uh, around one nanosecond between the two clocks, which are at CERN and in Gran Sasso. And then there were uh, many uh, calibration uh, uh, works on the timing chains at CERN and in Opera, 
in order to bring the uh, knowledge, the systematic knowledge of every element at the, at the nanosecond level. Uh, the other ingredient, as you have seen, are the protons. Uh, we uh, need the precise measurement of the uh, neutrino time distribution through the proton uh, distributions. So we stole the device at CERN in order to perform these measurements on the protons. And then the final ingredient is the knowledge of the baseline. So as you will see, uh, by, with a dedicated geodesy campaign, uh, we managed to reach 20 centimeter accuracy over 730 kilometers. So the result of all these ingredients at the end is to achieve a 10 nanosecond overall accuracy on the time of flight of neutrinos with the comparable statistical and systematic errors. Well, in, this, in this slide you see a sketch of the new system which was installed in 2008. So we didn't want to discard what was already existing uh, uh, operating at CERN and in Gran Sasso. So at CERN, there was one of these conventional receivers from Symmeticon, which is called XLI, which is the timing source of the general machine timing chain at CERN, which uh, then feeds all the timing of the accelerators. In parallel, in Gran Sasso, there was this receiver from uh, ESAT, which was working uh, since uh, the, the 90s. It was already used by the uh, macro experiment. And this was uh, sending the time underground so we, we decided to install a twin system, which is, uh, there, there are two uh, setups completely equal in Gran Sasso and uh, at CERN, which include a special uh, receiver for time transfer applications, which is called the Polar X, which is coupled to a cesium clock. And then uh, there is a, a, a DAQ system, which continuously compares the time, every second compares the time of this uh, special receiver with the time of the standard receiver. And this allows us to compute the corrections. And the same thing is done at CERN. So this allowed us to improve the systematic accuracy to reach a synchronization at the nanosecond level, but without touching what was already existing both at CERN and in Gran Sasso. So this slide is rather technical. I, I will go quickly uh, through that. Uh, one point that I would like to stress is that uh, these kind of techniques that we have been using are uh, maybe unusual for high energy physics, but they are quite common uh, in metrology for time transfer application between the many metrology institutes which are operating uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe. So this uh, Polar X uh, uh, receiver was characterized by the uh, Royal Belgian Observatory and it was already used in time transfer uh, uh, measurements. So the frequencies, uh, the reference frequency is provided by a cesium clock and then the receiver is capable of uh, performing an internal time tagging of uh, uh, it, the one PPS which is synchronous to the cesium clock with respect to the individual satellite observations. And you get the data offline which allow you to perform uh, all the corrections uh, which are uh, needed. And these data are written in this format which is called the CGGTS. Uh, and the other point is to use this uh, uh, code which is called the P3, which is uh, based on the measurement of two different frequencies in order to uh, get rid of the corrections due to the different uh, speed of light in the ionosphere with respect to the speed of light in vacuum. So I, I say that this is uh, a, a, sorry. This is a, a standard technique in metrology and established a permanent link at the one nanosecond level between the reference points at CERN and in the, in, uh, the opera timing chain. So here you can see a picture of the two uh, systems. So this is the, sorry. This is the, the installation uh, this is the installation operating at CERN in the CCR in uh, Prevesson. And this is the installation operating in Gran Sasso. So you see the uh, high accuracy system side by side to the standard one, which was operating in, in Gran Sasso. There were three clocks. We were working uh, with this one. And we have been working for all the data taking with the same clock. So a few words about the GPS. You know that uh, the GPS allows to find your uh, position on the Earth. Uh, well, it's uh, more general than that because it, it, resolves your, uh, it resolves your four vector 
in fact, it determines at the same moment uh, x, y, z, and your time. Uh, x, y, and z, they are uh, described with respect to a geocentric uh, system, uh, with uh, a, a Cartesian system with uh, the origin uh, at the center of the Earth. And you can find uh, your unknown by performing four satellite observations. So this is a system of uh, four equations in four unknowns, which allow to determine at the same uh, time the, the position and the time. So this is the standard GPS operate, operation. Then there is a special operation which has been used for this measurement, which is the so-called common view mode. So there we know already the position, because the position we, we can measure um, uh, from time to time with the GPS data and assume that it's stable. You will see later how it is stable. And then by knowing the position, you can just uh, find out your time. And uh, if you do it on two places, uh, two distant places of the Earth by looking at the same satellite, you get some, uh, 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 you benefit that the, some uh, systematics of the uh, transmission of the radio waves in the ionosphere will cancel out. And the reason is that uh, the distance of the satellite from the Earth's surface is 20,000 kilometers, which is uh, quite large with respect to the distance among the two sites, which is 730 kilometers. So by doing this common view mode, which is something that you have to perform, uh, it's an, ana an offline analysis that you have to perform, you can uh, uh, accurately synchronize these two places at uh, one nanosecond level. This is yet a, a kind of standard technique in, uh, in metrology. Okay, this is what you see when you perform uh, this kind of, of offline analysis. So these are the corrections uh, with respect to the standard GPS that uh, you have seen uh, at this kind of oscillation. So at the end, the corrections correspond to the blue points. Uh, the red points are before uh, quality cuts on the uh, quality of the signal from the satellites. Also, this is a, a standard procedure in the analysis of this data. And then you get this kind of corrections. Every point is uh, computed for a neutrino interaction in opera. So you see that there, there, there is an offset between the standard GPS clocks at CERN and Gran Sasso, the pre-existing one of about uh, in between 200 and 300 nanoseconds. And then you see the oscillation of the standard clocks, which are corrected by this uh, high accuracy device. Okay, so uh, by itself, uh, this, uh, these two systems were calibrated by the Swiss Institute of Metrology, METAS, and uh, their specification, they were corresponding to this uh, one nanosecond level uh, synchronization. Uh, we could have uh, believed that, but uh, when uh, we uh, knew that uh, there was this result, we decided to go to a completely independent uh, uh, confirmation by another uh, metrology institute, which is called uh, PTB in Germany. So they took data with a portable device, which was already used for this kind of operation in order to synchronize the US Naval Observatory, which handles uh, the GPS to uh, this uh, PTB Institute uh, in Germany. So they took data for uh, two weeks at CERN and in Gran Sasso, and they found an offset of uh, 2.3 nanoseconds with an error of 0 0.9, which is completely compatible with the calibration accuracy of the two uh, GPS detector, Polar X GPS detectors from uh, METAS. Now we, we come to uh, the timing of the protons. So for the, in order to measure the timing of the protons, we used a, a fast beam current transformer uh, detector, which is uh, installed on the CNGS uh, beam line. This is a device with large bandwidth of about 400 megahertz. And uh, it's coupled to a waveform digitizer, which works at one giga sample per second. And the, uh, the, the acquisition window of this waveform digitizer is triggered by a replica of the kicker signal. So we use the kicker signal just as a kind of pre-trigger to open a, a window in order to find events in Gran Sasso and to start the digitization of the protons. We do not use it for uh, accurate uh, timing. So these uh, uh, waveforms which are acquired by the digitizer, they are UTC stamped and stored in the CNGS database database for each 
uh, spill. So this is a, a quite uh, large amount of data that we have uh, really the uh, proton waveforms for each, uh, for all the spills which have been extracted to the CNGS target. So here you can see a picture of the device, it's this small one, it's not a large one, uh, during a calibration which was performed uh, in 2010 by injecting the signal from uh, the cesium clock in the test input of the BCT. So the, the, the shape of the protons, as you have seen, is not flat. It depends on the way the uh, beam is uh, produced uh, uh, by the PS and injected in the, uh, in the SPS. And uh, this is done, uh, half of the SPS, roughly half of the SPS, is uh, filled uh, with the five turns of the PS. So the beam which is contained in the PS is shaped with an electrostatic septum. So there are, these are the uh, five parts of the beams in the phase space which are then injected in the uh, SPS. And the, this operation uh, implies quite some uh, large losses which are are actually limiting uh, the performance uh, of the CNGS. Uh, we cannot go uh, beyond uh, a certain uh, limit which is uh, 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 due to radio protection uh, uh, requirements at the level of the PS. So these losses then they create the structures that uh, you see here which are related to the five turns. And uh, as I was saying before, uh, all this relies on the fact that the SPS circumference is 11 times the PS uh, circumference. So you can fill it with uh, uh, two injections from the PS and each one includes these uh, five turns. So this is, this is an example of the waveforms which are measured by the, uh, the BCT. Uh, so you see that there is uh, this oscillation here which if you zoom it corresponds to the uh, radio frequency in the SPS at 200 megahertz. So you see the, uh, the separation of five nanoseconds corresponding to the SPS radio frequency. So when uh, you have, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, all the uh, waveforms are stored in the database. So for each event that we record in Opera, we are able to uh, associate it to its uh, proton uh, waveform. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you have seen, uh, we, we cannot, uh, we don't know uh, within the spill which is the proton which has uh, uh, produced the neutrino which interacts in Gran Sasso. So uh, we can uh, uh, perform this measurement of the neutrino velocity in statistical way by comparing the distribution of neutrinos in Gran Sasso to, this, uh, to the waveforms which are recorded at CERN. So in order to do that, we sum uh, all the waveforms corresponding to the events which are uh, recorded by OPERA. And uh, this has to be done separately for the two extractions because as I mentioned, they have a different uh, timing. And then uh, we can compare this kind of distributions to the neutrino events uh, uh, recorded. By OPERA, timing. So the, the answer is yes, because the, uh, well, first of all, uh, there is a, a, a slight difference uh, between uh, the uh, proton velocity and the C in bringing the protons to the target. This accounts for a few uh, picoseconds. And then uh, also the particles, the mesons, which are produced by the interactions of the protons in the target are relativistic. So uh, you can get an idea from this analytic formula and uh, you have a difference uh, with, uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, by, uh, if you assume that all, everything, the mesons and the protons, they, they travel at the speed of light, or you uh, take into account uh, uh, all the details of the uh, velocities of the mesons, you have a difference which goes as the uh, gamma square of the mesons. And this can be uh, precisely computed because we have a full simulation of the beam line and uh, it's a completely negligible effect. And uh, it goes also in the direction of uh, uh, delaying uh, uh, the, uh, the neutrinos. Okay, so in this, uh, in this uh, uh, slide, there is a sketch of the principle of the measurement. So uh, we measure the, the, the proton waveforms uh, with the BCT. 
Then we know precisely the distance from the point where they are measured, the BCT and the Opera reference frame with the geodesy and also the knowledge of the beam line at CERN. We can shift the waveforms measured at CERN. These waveforms are tagged with respect to the UTC. We can shift them by taking into account the uh, time of flight which corresponds to this uh, distance divided by C. And then we compare uh, this uh, shifted waveform to the data recorded in Gran Sasso, which are also uh, UTC time tagged with this uh, high accuracy system which synchronizes at one nanosecond level. Then by computing uh, the difference between the two distributions, we can estimate a possible deviation uh, of the neutrino time of flight with respect to this uh, time of flight computed by assuming uh, C. So the, the geodesy is a, it's a very important ingredient and in order to be accurate uh, we had a, a dedicated campaign at uh, uh, Gran Sasso in 2010. So the, the main difficulty is not to uh, measure the positions outside but to bring them uh, underground as you, you can expect. So uh, during this campaign there were two new uh, GPS reference points which were installed at the um, two ends of the tunnel, of the highway tunnel. And then uh, uh, this information was brought underground independently from the two sides with a set of uh, optical triangulations. And by doing this uh, we introduce uh, a, a systematic inaccuracy, a, a, an error which is of the order of 20 centimeter which is uh, dominating our measurement. So uh, I, I have also to say that when the, these two independent uh, uh, measurements they matched at the center they were in, in very good agreement. So here you can see then uh, the uh, coordinates of these external references in the GF GPS reference system. They are expressed in this uh, ETRF 2000, which is a European uh, global system, which accounts also for effects related to the earth dynamics, the continental drift. And uh, by using these measurements, you can uh, combine uh, to the measurements taken at CERN in order to uh, c compute the baseline. So the measurements which were taken at CERN were taken uh, uh, when the uh, CNGS beam was started in 1998. All these uh, geodynamics calculations are quite accurate, so uh, we could have trusted the porting of this measurement through time. But then as a cross-check, we decided to repeat again the measurements at CERN and in Gran Sasso simultaneously. This was done in June 2011 in order to get more confidence on the result and this confirmed the other result. So this is the, the distance between the BCT and the origin of the opera reference frame and it is known at 20 centimeter level which are dominated by this procedure to port underground the external measurements. By having this high accuracy system we can also monitor the position of the antenna in the external laboratory and this is what we see on a very long uh, period. So you, you see uh, this smooth curve, uh, curve which corresponds to the continental drift and then in April uh, 2009 there was the effect of the earthquake which displaced the laboratory by about seven centimeters in the east and north direction. So this is just to give you a, an idea of the accuracy uh, with which you can uh, perform this kind of measurements which is uh, uh, maybe unusual for uh, high energy physics but is, uh, is uh, standard for uh, high accuracy ge geodesy measurements. Okay, then uh, uh, we have the, uh, the system is not so simple because we have two uh, chains for timing at CERN and in Gran Sasso and they must be calibrated uh, piece by piece and we use uh, two uh, techniques which are as inclusive as possible. So the idea is to measure uh, each time the uh, delay between two reference points in the timing chain without, for instance, uh, measuring uh, single elements with different techniques like, uh, for instance, uh, optical fibers. We do not measure the optical fiber with other techniques, but we try to perform an inclusive measurement which is directly related to the timing used by our measurement. So there are two techniques in order to do that. The first one is the portable cesium clock. 
So you have uh, one of these cesium clocks and you can measure the phase of its uh, signal, which is uh, produced uh, once uh, uh, per second, with respect to uh, the signal at the start of the chain and at the end of the chain. So there are various ways of doing that, either with a digital scope or by performing a time tagging. And then the other uh, uh, technique is to perform a double path measurement. In this case, uh, you introduce a, another path of propagation of the signal uh, with an optical fiber parallel to the path that you have to measure. And at the, at the end, you measure uh, the difference between the two uh, times, the, the two travel times of the signals. Then uh, by using exactly the same chain, uh, by just uh, reverting the transmitter and the receiver, you, you chain the, the signal from the end down to the start and you measure the sum of the two paths. And then by resol solving a system of two equations in two unknowns, you can uh, uh, measure uh, separately uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the additional path and the unknown path. And we have been using these two techniques in parallel for all the measurements we performed, and they gave the same result without the systematic uncertainty, which is typical at the, typically at the nanosecond level. Okay. For what concerns the BCT calibration, uh, this is a more delicate story. We performed a dedicated beam experiment. So this delay is uh, mainly the cable, which is used to bring the signal from the BCT to the uh, waveform digitizer, which is in the former UA2 counting room. But we, uh, as you have seen, we, we, we tried the first attempt by using the cesium clock, the portable cesium clock, and injecting the signal in the BCT. But then there was the question, is this really representative of what the protons do? And then we decided to check directly what the protons do in the BCT, and this was done with this uh, dedicated beam experiment where we had uh, two beam pickup detectors on the line. So we, we tagged the, the time, the transit time of the protons in these two detectors, and by knowing uh, the, um, well, with the survey, the geometry of the line, we could predict the transit time of the protons in the BCT, and then compare to the signal that we were measuring in the, uh, in the counting room. So this kind of technique uh, gives uh, an accuracy of five nanoseconds. And as I said, this delay is mainly determined by, by the cable, but we wanted really to be sure to have something which uh, uh, was representative of uh, what the protons do. So in order to do that, we used a special uh, beam condition. We used the LHC beam which has bunches of one nanosecond and uh, uh, they are separated by 50 nanoseconds. So you get a comb of this uh, uh, kind of point-like uh, pulses that then you can overlay, this is before the calibration, you can overlay with the signal of the BCT and this is the result after uh, having uh, overlaid the two which allows you to uh, measure this delay of uh, 580 nanoseconds. So here is a description of the timing chain at CERN. So as I said, we have this uh, uh, standard GPS, pre-existing GPS. Then we have the high accuracy one, the Polar X. And we have this uh, DAQ system, which is uh, made by these uh, devices, which are commonly used at CERN for uh, time tagging, which are called the CTRI. And uh, there is one of these devices in the previous uh, central control room where we have defined this uh, uh, reference point, which we call the T-CERN, which will be then uh, compared to a, a similar reference points in Gran Sasso for this synchronization at the nanosecond level. Then this uh, uh, timing is distributed through uh, a system to the different uh, CTRI, and we measure this delay by using the cesium clock and also by performing a two-way measurement. It goes in the CTRI, which is uh, sitting in the UA2 control room, where it is used to, to time tag the kicker signal and also to start the waveform uh, digitizer window, which is started 30 nanoseconds after the time tag of the kicker signal. So uh, the, the, then the BCT is uh, connected through this cable to the waveform digitizer, and uh, there is this additional delay with respect to the transit time of the protons in the BCT. The BCT is uh, about 700 meters uh, far from the target. 
So in Gran Sasso, we have a, a similar picture where we had the, the existing uh, uh, GPS system, then the high accuracy one, which makes the link to CERN. This is the reference point for the time link uh, between CERN and Gran Sasso. And then this, the signal of the standard GPS signal uh, the system in Gran Sasso is sent every millisecond underground to the Opera Master Clock, which is here. This delay was measured also with uh, two techniques by using the portable cesium clock and this uh, two uh, path measurement. And then uh, the Opera Master Clock distributes uh, the signal to the sensors and we take as a reference the last sensor of the chain. Uh, the sensors in each chain are aligned by uh, dedicated measurements and uh, also this uh, delay was measured in two ways, both by using the cesium and the two-way technique. And then we had to also to measure the uh, latency of the FPGA in performing the time tag and this was measured by performing uh, the, a time measurement at the same time with the data acquisition and with an external digital scope. And then you have the delays related to the detector. So uh, there, uh, there, I will go in more details later, but you can imagine that you have a delay from the time you get an interaction uh, uh, in the, uh, you get a particle which is measured, which produces light in the, in the uh, scintillator strip and the time the FPGA sees a trigger. So you have the transit time in the photomultiplier, the uh, time response of the analog chip which produces the trigger and so on. So these delays are on average, the total delay of the detector response is on average about 60 nanoseconds. So this, de this delay of the detector was measured also by using a technique with uh, uh, a picosecond uh, uh, laser, UV laser, which was injecting the scintillator strips in different points. And then we could extrapolate the time response uh, down to the surface of the photocathode in order to get the constant time which is given by the uh, transit time in the, in the photomultiplier, the response of the uh, analog chip which produces the trigger uh, and the porting of the signal to the FPGA. So then uh, there are other effects like uh, the position of the event in the strip, the, the dependence on the pulse site of the uh, trigger delay on the pulse site and the quanti quantization effect which are accounted by simulations which take into account parametrizations of the uh, time response of the strips which have been uh, um, derived from laboratory measurements. Okay, so this is a table. I, I, I don't want you to, to go through the numbers, but which includes all the delays which uh, uh, concern these measurements. And what is interesting is to see that uh, everything has been measured with uh, uh, different techniques. So all the delays of the chains were, uh, as I said, were measured with this portable cesium and also the two ways measurement. So this uh, two ways measurement, for instance, for what concerns the distribution of the UTC time at CERN, we kept uh, uh, permanently working since July 2011. Uh, up to now. So this is a plot which shows you the uh, variations of this uh, delay uh, with respect to the nominal value. And you see uh, the kind of accuracy here, the full scale uh, corresponds to plus minus 0 0.4 nanoseconds. So it's uh, well within uh, the uh, systematic accuracy that we have been uh, mentioning uh, before. Okay, now we go to the other side, to the event selection in Opera. So the, the result of this measurement is based on uh, 10 to the 20 protons on target. As I mentioned, we take both internal and external events and they uh, have a, uh, comparable statistics. So the internal events are about 7,500 and the external one 800, uh, 8,500. So the uh, possible bias on external events where the neutrino interacts in the rock They've been checked uh, the, with the Monte Carlo simulation and they uh, correspond to a two nanosecond systematic uncertainty when they are added uh, to the internal events. And the, uh, the way to make sure that there is not a large bias is to uh, require that there is a high energy muon entering in the detector. In this case, uh, the particle is relativistic 
and there is no uh, bias uh, on the time of flight, there is little bias on the time of flight of this secondary particle. Then this, this kind of bias we have been also checking directly because we could analyze separately the internal and external events as I will show you in a, in a moment. So once we get the events in the detector, they go to two kinds of corrections. The first one that I described before is the correction of the time link. And the second one is the uh, correction by the position of the earliest state which defines the time of the event. So uh, since the baseline is being, was computed with respect to this point, which is the origin of the opera reference frame, uh, one has to take into account the position of the, of the it and what matters is the longitudinal position along the beam. And we have an average corre correction for how the events are distributed of 140 centimeters, which correspond to 4.7 nanoseconds. And this uh, also we have been checking by performing the analysis with and without the correction, and it, it agrees uh, completely with the uh, Z distribution. Okay, the analysis method. So as I mentioned, for each event in opera, we can get its uh, proton waveform, then we can uh, sum them up, and we can get the uh, a probability distribution function which will represent the time distribution of the events detected by opera. We get two, one for each extraction because the two extractions have a different timing. And then we can enter in uh, this uh, uh, probability distribution function with the time of the event and uh, compute a likelihood function and we can do this in steps by adding these uh, extra parameters which describes the deviation from the uh, TOF computed assuming the speed of light. And uh, here you see the result, this uh, log likelihood plot, which uh, uh, gives you the delay uh, for the blind analysis. So you get this value which is uh, uh, 1048 nanoseconds which is deliberately uh, large, as I will explain later, in order to prevent that we could infer on the result without really knowing the calibration of all the elements of the, of the chain. So this blind analysis was done by ignoring many facts. So we were referring to a, a, a wrong baseline uh, we, which uh, was taking as a uh, reference point not the BCT used for the measurement but by another one which is in the SPS because we started like that in 2006 so we just kept uh, this procedure which is uh, of course wrong and will give you a, a, a huge uh, offset. We were ignoring the details of the time response and the DAQ in opera. We were using some old GPS intercalibration which was done in 2006 by bringing the standard GPS system from CERN to Gran Sasso and looking at the difference between the two systems. We were ignoring the BCT and waveform digitizer delays and also the UTC calibration at CERN. So this results in this very large difference of 1,048 nanoseconds. And we decided to open the box to look at the real result in March when we knew all the delays and in particular, the last one uh, that we had to know was the geodesy. It was the result of the integration of the measurements uh, taken in Gran Sasso with the measurements uh, taken at CERN. So uh, this is the result of the likelihood uh, uh, maximization. So here you have the, the, the curves of the protons and the neutrino distribution uh, in opera before uh, performing the likelihood maximization. And then uh, you can overlay them by correcting by the result of the likelihood maximization, which is this 1048.5 nanoseconds. And you see that there is a quite nice agreement. The uh, neutrino events in Gran Sasso are described by the shape of the protons, which is measured at CERN. And in particular, you see the leading uh, uh, and falling edges of the distribution, which are quite important in this measurement, which match the data points. This is better shown in this zoom, where you can see after uh, overlaying with the likelihood maximization result, the fronts for the first and second extraction. Oh, you see that there is a very good agreement between the experimental points and the cube, which is just one of the protons, just shifted by the result, this delta t computed with the likelihood. 
We performed uh, several cross-checks of the analysis, so uh, this analysis can be performed uh, for the two extractions separately, which have completely different timing, but they give the same result. And then it can be computed year by year, and here you see uh, the data taken in 2009, 2010, and 2011, compared to the overall uh, result. And then we even try to compute this analysis in some arbitrary subsamples, for instance, by taking the, the data, uh, the neutrino events uh, which occur during the night or the day, and the two beans, they agree within the errors, so we saw a difference of Seventeen nanoseconds between the two beans, uh, plus with an error of 15 point. And again, uh, the result is a difference of 11 nanoseconds with an error of 14.3. And then uh, the other legitimate question was to remove the external events. And by taking, uh, this is the result with, uh, which includes external and internal events. By taking only the internal events, you get a result which is uh, compatible within the systematic accuracy that we were expecting from the Monte Carlo simulation. So then uh, after having uh, performed this cross check and by knowing uh, the, all the uh, calibration delays, we could open the box. And this is a table which summarizes the differences between uh, the uh, blind analysis, the, the situation which was corresponding to 2006 and the final analysis. So as uh, I mentioned, we were assuming a wrong baseline. We were not taking into account the uh, final UTC calibration. We were not taking into account the BCT and the waveform digitizer. We were not taking into account the delays in the detector. And finally, we were not taking into account the time link, but some uh, prior GPS synchronization. So if you take into account all these factors, you get to a global shift of uh, minus 987.8 nano. Seconds. And the other table describes or considering uh, uh, by neglecting the, the uh, velocity of the pions, uh, the uh, bias is very small. Uh, the bias on the interaction point in Gran Sasso for external events, the measurement of the UTC delay, the measurement of the delay in the distribution of the signal in Gran Sasso from the external clock to the, inter to the underground all and the transmission of the synchronization of, of the DQ system, the FPGA latency, the waveform, uh, fast waveform digitizer trigger delay, the synchronization among the two sides, the uh, systematic uncertainty on the Monte Carlo simulation, which is used in order to evaluate the uh, position dependence, the response of the target tracker, and the BCT calibration. So all these uncertainties added in quadrature, they amount to 7.4 nanoseconds. So this is the
as a sampling calorimeter with this uh, lead blocks and the uh, target tracker. And uh, the, dif the difference, well, you will see the difference between the two beans, but uh, here there is the result expressed for these internal events for which we know the energy, which is uh, an anticipation of 60.3 nanoseconds uh, corresponding to an average event energy of 28 GB. So this is not the average neutrino energy in the beam, is for interacting neutrino is a higher energy. So this is the result uh, by considering these two beams in energy where we do not see a significant uh, energy dependence within the statistical accuracy of our measurement, which is uh, uh, not very good when you start taking the internal events, you lose statistics and you see then you divide uh, even the sample in, in two parts and the statistical uncertainty is large. And here you can see the overall result for which there is no energy scale because this includes also the external. The detector at LNGS uh, has allowed the most uh, sensitive terrestrial measurement of the neutrino velocity over a baseline of about 730 kilometers. So we improved by about a factor uh, 10 with respect to the previous measurement of MINUS. We profited of the large statistics which was accumulated by OPERA, 16,000 events, of this dedicated upgrade of the CNGS and OPERA timing systems, an accurate geodesy campaign and a series of calibration measurements which were conducted with different and complementary techniques. The analysis of data from 2009, 2010, and 2011, part of 2011, the 2011 run is still going, was carried out to measure the neutrino time of flight for CNGS uh, mu neutrinos traveling through the Earth crust with an average energy of 17 GB. The result of the analysis uh, indicate an early neutrino arrival time with respect to the one computed by assuming the measured baseline divided by the speed of light of uh, 60.7 plus minus 6.9 plus minus 7.4 nanoseconds. So we spent six months in uh, various cross-checks. We cannot explain the observed effect in terms of non-systematic uncertainty. Therefore, uh, we uh, present to you today this uh, discrepancy, this anomaly, with respect to uh, what we would have expected by assuming the speed of light. And this is a, has an overall significance of six sigmas. So we also investigated the possible energy dependence of the effect in the energy domain which is covered by the CNGS beam and within the statistical accuracy of the measurement, you have seen that the errors are quite large. Uh, we do not observe any significant effect. And now I have to add the many words of uh, caution uh, from uh, all us. So uh, despite the large uh, significance of this measurement that you have seen, and the stability of the analysis, since it has a, a potentially great impact on uh, physics, this motivates the continuation of our studies in order to identify still unknown systematic effects, and we look also forward to independent measurements from other experiments. And for the same reasons, we do not attempt any theoretical or phenomenological interpretation of the result. Thank you. Professor Ting, if you would like, I would like maybe to try to structure maybe the, uh, a bit the discussion. I mean, uh, so what I propose is that uh, um, we, we, we try uh, uh, first to, to really address the experimental results which have been uh, presented to, to us today. I mean, this is the most important. And uh, so since the, uh, uh, the velocity is a ratio of uh, distance divided by time, and uh, uh, I propose that we first maybe take question about the geodesy, I mean, about if there are questions about the, the distance. Then we will take question about the time, and then maybe after we, we will take question af uh, about the analysis. And then, <laughs> finally, what I propose is if at the end some people want to make comments to ask questions about, uh, 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 you know, what they have in, in 
the head about theoretical or whatever, interpretation or the doubts or whatever. Of course, they are free to do so. We should keep it at the end. And, uh, and uh, as, as was really written in the, uh, in the previous uh, slide, I mean, this somehow will be an, an internal discussion inside the auditorium because our colleagues w have decided not to give any, uh, any um, interpretation of the result. So, okay, so maybe Professor Ting, if you want. By the way, there is uh, this auditorium, okay, you can use that, but it's very well equipped with uh, uh, um, microphones. You can push on it, and then you have to release afterwards. Uh, I want to congratulate you for this extremely beautiful experiment. I'm very familiar with some of the technologies you used. The experiment <coughs> is very carefully done with systematic error, carefully checked. So to, just to summarize your thing, uh, so obviously, as you have correctly said, other experiments should be done, and you will look at yourself because of tremendous implications. So my first thing is to congratulate you. And it is very difficult for experimentalists to make comments about other people's experiments because experiment has so many complicated things. Certainly, I am not qualified to comment on your things. But just the impression is it's a extremely well done experiment. So that is my number one. Uh, my number two is I was wondering if Professor Takiki is here. It's because in 1979, he was the person who proposed Grand Sasso, orientated Grand Sasso Hall to, to a CERN and foresee one day this type of experiment should be done. And that I also want to congratulate him. Uh, I'll finish. Thanks a lot. I think we all share Thank somehow you very your much. congratulations. So first uh, question about position. So Jasper, maybe. Uh, okay, so so um, let, let's assume that you really do have very, very good geodesy on the antenna. Okay, that, that I think has been demonstrated many times by the GPS. Now it's the transfer down underground that you've, you've got. Now you have very, very impressive cross checks on the timing. That looks very, very solid. But if I understand correctly, your cross checks on the geodesy are basically to have had a team do it twice or something like that and come up with the same number. Now, if you do it twice, you might make the same systematic error twice. I mean, is there a completely independent way drilling a hole down to the apparatus or you know, <laughs> doing something totally crazy? Well, look, if, if this is a true measurement, drill a bloody hole, you know, I mean, you know, what's a hole? This is, uh, we're trying to understand something very, very fundamental here. But you need, you need a completely independent method rather than just repeating the same technique. So, so uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, in fact, if you want, uh, there are two uh, elements of um, cross-checks in this measurement. The fact that the measurements were taken at the two sides of the tunnel independently. And then when they crossed, they were within a few centimeters. This is the first uh, cross-check. Second cross-check is that uh, all this was already done at the time uh, uh, CNGS was started. And at the end, this uh, new result is within uh, 60 centimeters in agreement with the previous one. So it's uh, within uh, the error of the previous one. It's more precise because we, we wanted to achieve an accuracy better than one meter. So this was done. Uh, but it is also in agreement to the previous one uh, within 60 centimeters. Then for what concerns the all, we have been thinking about that. And for, uh, as, uh, as far as we know, drilling a, a, a hole, like you suggest, can be done uh, with 5% accuracy on its verticality. So if you do it over one kilometer, this will be uh, a large uncertainty, much larger than what I've been uh, quoting uh, before. Other question on geodesy with Tiziano? Uh, in, it's again a little bit trying to understand whether there is any systematics which uh, might be relevant. I'm here. Ah, here. Yeah. Uh, now, in your paper, you, you, you claim that um, 
uh, tidal deformations are negligible. And I can possibly assume that this is no other explanation. So I, I, I take it that you probably assume that given that you took data for <coughs> continuous period of time, any tidal deformation would average out. Yes. Now, but that does not apply to the fact that you took the geodesic measurement at a given time, which might have been affected, might have been with tidal deformations which were different from the average uh, of zero, which is what, we, and I remember from the campaign we had the year at CERN, in fact, we, we, I think the year there's the intelligentsia about tidal deformation is, is concentrated at CERN. Uh, it was a few ppm effect in terms of the size of uh, LEP, for example. So uh, while it is, okay, still much below the 25 ppm effect which you, you seem to be measuring, I would not consider it negligible necessarily, and probably one should try to make an effort to, to see you, whether, because I've not seen anything to that extent. Can you comment on it? Oh, okay, yes. Uh, actually, I, I should uh, give some more details on how these measurements were taken. In fact, they are not uh, um, measurements which are concentrated in the time, but a campaign like that it lasts uh, at least one week of measurements. So you, uh, you can cross-check the measurements outside the tunnel during uh, one week. And this was done twice, as I mentioned. It was done in 2010, and then it was repeated in uh, June 2011, so in completely different conditions. And the, the two measurements uh, were in, agree at the, in agreement at the centimeter level, as the geodesy people were expecting. So this is the kind of answer I can, uh, I can give you. Valtteo? Well, did you, I think it's worth monitoring uh, this distance as a function of uh, the position of the moon because the crust of the earth is deformed by the moon and could have an effect of the order 10 to the minus 5. It's not a big effect, but I'm surprised that with two geodesic uh, measurements, uh, you assume that to be a correct distance. I think it should be monitored uh, according to the location of the moon. Okay. We, 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 indeed, we took a three, from taking also the, the previous, uh, previously existing uh, one. And then uh, you, you, you can see on this kind of plot that I'm showing, this is uh, made on a very long time, and you don't see this kind of effects. Uh, these are high frequency data on the GPS. There are, there, there are points which are computed at the minute level. And then they, in this plot, there are points uh, which are at the uh, fraction of the day. And these kind of effects are not really visible uh, by the measurements that we have been, uh, we have been uh, taking. I have a comment on this. Uh, I'm sorry. No. This is a local measurement. It is not something which is made no, of the baseline of 730 kilometers. The, here you see just the position of the yes. antenna, and you see that it doesn't sure. move. No, you are completely is, right. Point. You are completely right, but it should be, however, affected by these uh, movements, at least locally. I can relate because it's something I have to tell yeah. you. We are also in contact with the outside world. In yeah. a way, I mean, some journalists are, are, are sending questions to, to Arno. And uh, one question which comes uh, from the, us. Uh, excuse me. The other yeah. point yes. is that uh, we take the data over. Uh, we took yeah. data over three years, so all this should average out yeah. because the, the these tidal movements are uh, cyclic. Yeah. One question from outside is. Uh, is this kind of measurement, this kind of accuracy of 20, 20 centimeter over 1,000 kilometer, is it something which has been done uh, elsewhere? I mean, uh, is it uh, yeah. is a state of the art or far from the state of the art? Uh, it's, a, it's a common, uh, if you want, it's common practice. And uh, the 20 centimeters are even a kind of bad performance, not related to the external points, <coughs> which are at a centimeter level, but to the fact that we had to bring underground these measurements, and this was done in difficult conditions because uh, we had to do it in the highway, and we couldn't stop the traffic for uh, one week in the highway. So at the end, we negotiated to stop one lane, which is what you see there, uh, one lane in one of the two tunnels. You know that there are two independent tunnels. 
So the traffic was stopped for one week, and then you had to work the triangulations in this uh, a small space corresponding to one lane. And so this justifies the 20 centimeters in accuracy, but it can be done much better if we stop completely the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's worth doing. Other question on the, on the distance or... or uh... Yes, please. Six years ago, I prepared the paper that explains that velocity greater than speed of light is possible in special relativity. And uh, this paper is in your mail. Please look. <laughs> I think as I said, we can discuss it afterwards. I mean, maybe you just entered into the auditorium. Okay, um, other question? Uh, no, I mean, is it about, uh, or timing now, distance or timing? Please, John. So, so there's actually a question about distance. So did you take into account the rotation of the Earth? Yes, we, we, we performed the calculation and it's a sub-nanosecond uh, level effect. Because if, I, yes. if I'm not mistaken, you know, the Grand Sessor Laboratory moves it slightly further away yes. from CERN during the rotation. Yes. Yeah, I also got the same estimate. Yes. Okay. Gigi, uh, sorry, Gigi. <laughs> You measure your waveform with all the protons. Yes. But then you detect only the central core of the beam. Has yeah. this uh, any effect? I mean, is there any correlation? Is, I have no okay. idea. Okay. So, uh, no, no, you, you, you ask the right uh, question. So, this is also related to the quality of the beam, uh, of the CNGS beam, because as you say, as you point out, there might be, I don't know, some ELOs, some. Uh, strange effects at the beam level. So, uh, in the construction of the CNGS beam, for reasons of integrity of the target, because the target is subject to a very big sh thermal shocks when it receives the protons. He was required to uh, steer the proton beam within uh, 500 uh, microns from the center, uh, the theoretical impact point at the center of the target. After this is done much, much better, a factor 10 better. And the RMS, this is shown in this uh, picture, is uh, going from 50 uh, to 90 microns if you consider the horizontal or the vertical uh, uh, dimension. And this has also been checked, checked for what concerns the uh, um, position of the muon centroid in the muon chambers, which reflects what happens at the level of the target. So uh, the beam is also, uh, the transfer line is essentially lossless. So what we measure in the BCT goes really in neutrinos. So by all these uh, elements, we think that there is really no correlation uh, between uh, uh, what happens uh, at the level of the BCT and the finally the space correlations uh, with the beam uh, in Gran Sasso. This is just given by the kinematics of the pion decay, by this uh, uh, PT of the pion decay. You know? Uh, just to clarify uh, some statements in this seminar. Uh, out of the two variables, distance and time, one is probably dominant in terms of error. My impression is that time is dominant yeah, correct. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. another thing is that, you know, a quick estimate in my head is shows that of the order of 50, you need additional delay, for example, in the certain side of, of the order of 50 nanoseconds to get the result. Is it correct or not? Uh, yes, we have many detail, delays, but not just no, no, of the, 50 I mean, un unaccounted delay. Of, of ah, order unaccounted delay. Yes, delay. Of, yes. 50, 60 delay. nanoseconds. Yes, unaccounted or delay. At the level of what, what is the total delay which you have now? What is the accuracy on the delay measurement? No, 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 what is the total delay? Uh, the total delay is 60, uh, uh, the, the, the total delay at CERN. Yes. Well, these are uh, large delays in some cases. Uh, I will show you the, the previous picture.
Okay, so this is the setup at CERN. So for instance, uh, here you have uh, something like uh, 10 microseconds. So this is uh, what, has, what I showed is measured continuously since July. Uh, uh, increase of systematic error which yes. would explain yes. so you, it you seems to me that first statement is that time is dominant and second for example if I look at where the time is coming from the delay at CERN should be increased by about yes, 15 and that's second, correct. which yes. is actually a small number compared yes. to the total yes, delay that's correct Augusto yeah uh, Dario thank you I am here yes so ba basically when you do a time of flight you have an arrival time and a departure time and I believe you're making a very good job on the arrival time, but the departure time, as far as I understand, has a 10 microsecond uncertainty. Now, with 10,000 10, events or so, the overall uncertainty is, is uh, 10 microseconds divided by square root of 10,000. Uh, indeed. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned, uh, if you take just uh, the uncertainty on the uh, average time of this distribution, it may match what you were, uh, were quoting. But we are performing this likelihood maximization, which takes into account all the delays, all the details of this distribution, and in particular the fronts, which play a big role in the uh, determination of the statistical uncertainty. So the, this we have been checking also with the Monte Carlo techniques, because we can take uh, this uh, uh, curve, which has been measured at CERN, and we can generate 100 uh, opera experiments, for instance, with the typical statistics that we have been uh, using for this measurement, and we can check the statistical accuracy on the results of these uh, individual simulated uh, experiments. So the fact that you, you perform this likelihood maximization by using all the features of this uh, uh, proton waveform allows you to bring the uh, statistical uncertainty at this level of uh, about seven nanoseconds. Jürgen, yes. Find the microphone. Uh, this is a question concerning both space and time. Now, if one uses photomultipliers and scintillators, early arrival times can actually happen if a particle doesn't hit the scintillator but hits directly the photomultiplier and makes some Cherenko flight, for example. Now, it so happens that your average uh, delay time is just 60 nanoseconds. So did you check whether it's possible that some spray particles, instead of going to the scintillator, hit the photomultiplier, in particular as you always take the first one? Yeah, so uh, for what concerns the photomultiplier, we are, uh, you should uh, uh, take into account that we are in a, in a really very quiet environment. So we have been checking... Uh, also, uh, these rates, uh, uh, when, uh, by taking measurements, when the photomultiplier is disconnected from the fibers, we have been measuring uh, the dark count of the photomultipliers underground and so on. So this is a quiet environment. Then for what concerns the earliest heat, uh, we also performed some uh, cross-checks. Uh, because, uh, as I mentioned, we go through this Monte Carlo simulation, which has, uh, to which we attributed uh, an uncertainty of... Uh, three nanoseconds, the systematic uncertainty of three nanoseconds. And uh, uh, yes, this one. So we have been checking, for instance, uh, by comparing the uh, on track with respect to this earliest hit, we found uh, differences at the nanosecond level which are com comparable with the uh, uncertainty that we are assuming on the simulation. Or we have been checking also the average time of the event without performing track reconstruction with respect to the earliest hit. Uh, Tiziano, you had another question? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be diligent, so now I have a question on timing. Now, concerning this uh, correction, I mean, I think you pointed out that the uh, beam, beam current transformer. Yes you, besides checking it out with the pulser, which is basically the cesium source, you, you wanted to see what was the response to proton. I think that was a very good idea. In fact, uh, we, we have lived through difficulties in, uh, for, for estimating the luminosity at LHC <laughs> coming from the, the current transformer. Uh, now, the point is that what you check there is really, I think, a different situation from what uh, is the protons which you use. 
because uh, you, you said you use an LHC injection cycle. So that is 50 nanoseconds spacing of bunches which are a factor 10 at least intensity compared to the one you use, which are instead the 5 nanoseconds separated at much lower intensity. Now again, I mean, I, I agree with you that you are measuring a, a, essentially the length of a cable. On the other end, it's obvious that uh, I'm not sure that, uh, the, if you, that you are using a representative proton uh, bunch going through it and, and structure. So can so you comment on that? Yes. Yes. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I it's also, a, it's a good question. <laughs> again again yeah. on the thing, I have another question. I mean, you showed in your analysis the effect of having zero nanosecond mm. yes. uh, difference or 1048, yeah. which was the, uh, the wrong, if you like, before opening the, yes. the box yes. Yes. Uh, calibration. Uh, I wonder how the chi-square would change from your feet if you moved no. it by, by I will, by, I will, I will, by show, you, I will show you something. Uh, yeah, you're right. Given that so, you're depending basically on for, the for what concerns the BCT, I didn't give uh, all the details. So, so we performed also this calibration by injecting a signal from the cesium clock to the test input. So the test input uh, has just uh, a, another uh, uh, winding around the toroidal transformer which detects the beam. Eh? So this uh, result is in agreement with the result uh, of, uh, which we got with the beam, with the LHC beam. And then we took also measurements with the CNGS beam. Uh, and with the CNGS beam, we have also a comparable result, but we have larger uncertainty. And the larger uncertainty is due to the fact that with the CNGS beam, you have a, a continuous beam, and then uh, it's difficult to uh, make this kind of overlay that you see here, which here is uh, unambiguous because you have this comb that you have to overlay. In the case of the CNGS beam, you have an ambiguity of a, a couple of uh, batches, which brings the systematic uncertainty to 10 nanoseconds, but the, the measurement was comparable. So at the end, we uh, decided to use this measurement with the LHC beam, which is very clean, where there are no ambiguities in uh, uh, deciding who is who. Then for what concerns the other question that you, you raised, the one related to the uh, to the change, because uh, here you are right, uh, it's difficult to see how it, uh, the distribution will compare if you uh, assume no effect. So there, there are some distributions that I can show you where you can compare the uh, no effect, so the TOF, uh, computed assuming the speed of light to the one. Okay, so here, th these are the distribution of the fronts. That is just part of the information. It doesn't uh, depend just on that. So here you see uh, what happens if you have no effect. So you have a systematic displacement of the red curve with respect to the experimental points. And this is by taking the effect uh, coming uh, from the likelihood of the maximization which is 60.7 nanoseconds. So you see this kind of systematical displacement. And then this is for the first extraction. Then mentally, you have to combine to the same information from the second extraction, which is shown here. Uh, and also here, you see the same picture. There is a, a systematical anticipation of the points with respect to the curve, which is then fixed when you take the outcome of the likelihood. So this is just to give you uh, an idea of the kind of effect that you could uh, imagine to see on the fronts. Just a question, sorry. John first, uh, you will come later. Okay. Yeah, John. So uh, looking at the uh, MINOS paper from a few years ago, it seems that the dominant timing uncertainties are not associated with GPS and all that stuff, but actually internal to the detector. And uh, in particular, they the largest individual error seems to be associated with the uh, antenna fiber length. And they make the comment that they've measured this in several different ways and they got different answers. Correct. So, so my question to you, I guess, is how were you able to control this uncertainty, a factor of 10 better than what they were? That's correct. It's a very good question, I'm happy you ask. So first of all, for what concerns the antenna? They didn't go through a calibration procedure from a metrology institute, apparently. Our receivers were calibrated with the antenna cable, 
as well. <coughs> and you have seen the kind of agreement that then we got when the PTB made this independent measurement. This exactly relies on this kind of calibrations like the antenna delay, the internal delay of the detector and so on. So there are means of calibrating this very precisely. I don't know why they didn't do that, but it can be done uh, even rather quickly, this kind of operation. For what concerns the fibers, uh, we, as I mentioned before, we don't measure the fibers by themselves because then you go in this kind of uh, situations where you use a technique which maybe is related to a different wavelength, uh, to different equipment and so on. So we try to perform an inclusive measurement where we were measuring the delay which uh, uh, comes out from the two equipments before and after the transmission of the fibers, but we didn't measure the fiber individually. This is an inclusive measurement between two, two reference points of the uh, timing chain. And this we repeated two times with the cesium and even by making this two part measurement with another fiber and they agreed with, at the uh, nanosecond level. Maybe my timing friends uh, would like to comment also on this. I, I think your explanation was perfect and everybody understood it. I, I just wanted to say uh, that um, I thank you for your kind words and for the timing team at CERN. It was uh, an incredible experience to wor work with uh, you and with Julia. Thank you. You want to question? Just a curiosity. Uh, there is some time dependence of this result. Uh, I mean, uh, did you try to compare the results uh, analyzing just the 2009 data set and the expression. Uh, yes. Maybe I was too fast uh, so yeah. that. Uh, there is a, a clue. Well, so I will show it again. Yeah, I think they were shown 2009, 10, and 11 are perfectly Sorry if it is, uh, was. Uh, too fast. So this, uh, this, is, uh, this comparison is made at the blind uh, level. So you see you have uh, comparisons which uh, um, uh, concern data taken at the different periods of time in 2009, 2010, 2011. And then we made also a comparison. We made two bins, one for the data taken during the night and one during the day. And there is no difference within the system, the uh, statistical uncertainty in the same spring plus fall versus summer. Okay. David? Yes, first a general comment. Um, you're, you're not measuring any vectorial quantity here, so the title of the paper should be neutrino speed, not velocity. So that's the first comment. <laughs> uh, now, so the main issue here, I think, is the you have a time of flight measurement, and uh, you only have two measurements for the numerator, the geodesy. Can you go back to slide 32, please? Because you keep claiming that you measure things over three years, but your distance is measured only twice. And the two measurements here, I want to understand how the GPS, the X, Y, Z, T uh, coordinates, they, ch they are different in the third uh, significant figure, but you claim uh, uncertainties in the seventh uh, significant figure. So I want to understand what that. So here, you see, yeah, yeah, this one here. I skipped that, sorry. Uh, uh, yes, all right. Here, this one. Yes. Well, <laughs> I don't know, I, I see here differences in the third significant figure, I mean, in the different GPS, and uh, at the end things combine down to uncertainties in the seventh significant figure, so I want to understand so, how. But uh, these are not the same point, eh? these are four different points. It's not the same point measured the four times. Maybe I was not clear on that. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned that we installed two benchmarks at the two sides of the tunnel. Benchmark means a reference point. So these are kind of monoliths that you measure, and the one and two are uh, Teramo side, and three and four are L'Aquila side, and you get the coordinates of these four uh, reference points, but you should not compare among themselves. I think that the, uh, the, the key thing here, because we are, I mean, it's a, a very important result, if it holds true, I think is to really remeasure this distance, I think. Yeah. What, what about re general relativity effects? Are those taken into account in this, are those so corrections important? So, that's, that's a question that's <laughs> from outside so we, about we, that. We took into account the general relativity uh, effects at the level of the clocks, uh, because the clocks in Gran Sasso and uh, at CERN, they are not at the same uh, height. And, but you have to take into account that these two clocks are not free running. They are continuously resynchronized to the common view mode. 
So this effect is at a level of 10 to the minus 13. <laughs> Just a moment, there was a question. Uh, yes. Uh, your likelihood analysis gives information on a constant delay. Uh, what happens if the delay is not constant for some reason? Yeah. Okay, so this is also a good question because it's a really uh, model uh, related in the sense that uh, when you uh, try to analyze this data with respect to a particular theoretical model, you get some uh, rel uh, dispersion relationships and you should uh, uh, have a, a, a shift but also energy dependence, this kind of uh, uh, effects. So we deliberately decided not to go to this kind of procedure, but this is something that it could be done in, uh, in the future. Yes, please. I want to ask a simple question. Uh, is there a chance that uh, due to some temperature variances between the above the Grand's atmosphere and the Grand's so, and the, there's a somewhat constant shift or varying shift between the GPS signals? Did you consider this? Okay, no. Uh, yes. For what concerns the, the, the GPS signals, uh, there are the main corrections are at the level of the ionosphere. So it's not the local uh, temperature. And these are uh, taken into account with this uh, P3 code, which is the combination of two different frequencies, which allow you to reconstruct the uh, rela um, dispersion relations in the ionosphere. So then there are some si si uh, residual systematic related to the P3 code. There is another kind of combination which is more precise, which allows you to perform measurements at the 100 picosecond level but we were not interested in uh, such accuracy. For us, one nanosecond was uh, more than enough. I have, uh, okay, Maurizio, I think maybe we should try to finish. Can you go back to the, the plot where we showed the difference between no effect and the effect yes. curves on top of your point? Do you agree that the effect is completely driven by the plots on the right? I mean, if I look at the plots on the left, I would say that the two... Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, there is also an effect... Okay, no, no, it's uh, not this one. They have to go. Which plot are you looking for? Yeah, I, I know what he, may, he wants to see. Yeah, okay, this one. Okay. So, as I said, this is part of the picture, but you can see that there is also an effect of, uh, it's difficult to judge by eyes eh, because then you have to take into account also the fluctuations of the points, but you see that there is a systematic effect also on this side. And then you have to combine with the other extraction which is shown uh, in the other page where you can also see that there is a, a, no, a wait, systematic wait, wait, wait. shift. Wait, if I look at the one on the bottom, it has the same fluctuation on the other no, side. No, the fluctuations are there because... Oh, no, but it's, there is a directional fluctuation for the top P figure to prefer to go above the curve as much as I see in the center of your figure the same tendency of the points to be below your curve. So I would say that the, on the left, the, the fact that the 60.7 is preferred with respect to zero it's a less evident stain statement, not at the six sigma level, of the fact that on the right, I see, I mean, on the right, it's, it's I mean, if I do a binomial test on the plot on the, on the top right, the, the one on the top is completely crazy. So what I'm wondering is, are we sure that the red curve that you measure here, it's not deformed by the fact that, the fact that you're measuring the neutrinos after 730 kilometers is by itself uh, a selection rule that is biasing the shape. 
Well, there are very, uh, which kind of systematics do you assign to the red? Selection shape? rule on uh, neutrinos arriving uh, to Gran Sasso, this is what you mean? I mean, what, what I'm saying is that are we sure that what you're getting in is an, ensemble, an unbiased sample of the protons that are starting at CERN, or maybe you're getting a shorter view of the beam? Yeah. So this uh, goes to the comment uh, I, I, uh, I answered before in the sense that as far as we know for what concerns the uh, beam uh, stability, the, 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 the way the beam works, uh, what we see in the BCT is entirely co uh, converted in neutrinos and there is not uh, such a dependence uh, for what concerns the uh, space position uh, of the neutrinos which are detected uh, by OPERA. I don't know if somebody from CNGS, Elias, do you want to add something? <laughs> Maybe, uh, Dario, you should stress that the fit is done globally. Yes. So all the peaks sure. and valleys that you have in the center part play a role yeah. in, in, the yeah. fit, in the overall fit. So this is just an expansion, <laughs> a, a zoom of the, of the, of the tails. Huh? Don't forget that there is a, yeah. a wide section of peaks and valleys. The measurement, I guess, is completely dominated by the turn on and the turn yes, off, because if I look at the curve on the plateau, I can fit everything on that. Yes, I think it's the age of the most No, there is, there is, a, there is also a role of what is happening in the middle. Okay. I have also a question on this point. If you go to the previous one where you see the overall thing, I wonder... One yes, yes, I'm, I'm, the I'm going there. The okay. Just a second. My, my question is, what are the parameters? You, you also have a normalization parameter, not only... Because, yeah, you must have also a normalization parameter that you can play together with the shift. And looking to the other picture, it seems to me that if you would allow a different in normalization, you would even the delta t equals zero would not be so bad. In other words, how many, you, are, you don't have, uh, you have two things to worry. One is the, sh the delay, the moving, but uh, you also have a normalization, and the two things uh, could, play, could be played together. So, uh, for what concerns the normalization, we are uh, uh, normalizing uh, the curves on the number of events. So every uh, waveform, a proton waveform, is normalized to the event which has been observed. If you take the area of these two curves, of the data and the proton curve, they correspond, they uh, correspond to the same number of events. So the normalization is fixed in this procedure. It's not uh, free. But not when you compare with the protons. Yes, with the protons. Normalized to the number of neutrino interactions that we record in Gran Sasso but non, not normalized through the cross-section, eh? normalized in the way that the, the two distributions correspond to the same number of events. You had a comment? Yeah. Yes. Um, so just to re reformulate uh, the comment by Maurizio, um, you are sampling only the core of the neutrino beam, which is quite broad at the Gran mm -hmm. Sasso. So can it be that this time distribution is shortened because you are sampling the, the particles which, you know, come most directly, because this is what he was asking for. It, this, is, uh, this plot is showing a, a one microsecond shift, mm -hmm. but the other ones are showing the difference between zero and 60 mm -hmm. nanoseconds over uh, you know, 10 microseconds. Mm -hmm. So if you get a shorter burst, because mm -hmm. you are sampling the core of the beam, mm -hmm. then what he was saying is that uh, you are just sensitive to the ending, to the turn off of the the distribution, and this could make a shift, which is not really a shift, it should be a shrink of the distribution. So this but is the yes. suggestion. What, what do you mean by, uh, wh which kind of relationship do you see between uh, the core of the beam and the timing? That's the main uh, question. I'm, I'm not saying ah. that this is the reason. I'm saying that okay. he was asking whether okay. you kept the 
the uh, stretching of the distribution as a free parameter. Yeah, no, we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't cap the stretching as a free parameter because this is also related to the possible dispersion and the energy de the dependency. So, but then for what concerns your uh, hypothetical relationship between uh, the core and the timing, if you want the distribution of neutrinos in Gran Sasso is just uh, broad because of the pion, uh, the, the PT in the pion decay, is not really related to the timing issue of what you measure in the BCT. So this kind of uh, relation yeah. is uh, accidental. There is no correlation between the position in Gran Sasso and the timing that we measure itself. It would be very hard to explain uh, this kind of relation. If the, if the horn would become weak at the end of the beam speed, okay, for example. Okay, that's a good uh, question as well. <laughs> You have, you have muon detectors which should be able to tell you whether the distribution at the beginning of the spill or at the end of the spill is the same, right? Yeah. Yes. At least in the picture in your, in yeah, your paper there is muon de detectors which... So for what concerns... May I answer him uh, first? So for what concerns the horn, the excitation of the horns lasts over uh, uh, several milliseconds. So we are just... Uh, uh, sampling uh, uh, a small part of it. I think that this plot it is not even uh, corresponding to the reality. It should have been zoomed on the flat part uh, of the horns. Yeah. I thought uh, there are so many questions, but we yeah. should. Uh, uh, well, there was one over, over, over there first, but can you shout or, or use the microphone, yeah. please? And then, then, uh, okay, so, this is a question purely about analysis, which is what you said was the third group. Yeah, yes, we are already. Uh, Fine. Hi, Dario. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that for the internal events, you make a division into two energy bins uh, to check for effects. But for the external events, <coughs> there is a correlation between the energy of the incoming muon and the distance travelled by the neutrino from the beam line, because the different mu the, because muons. Uh, Neutrino to muon interactions taking place in different parts of the rock see a different amount of DEDX. So, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, no, I understand what you mean. Uh, uh, you don't know really where these muons have been generated, but I also showed you that if we remove completely these external uh, muons, we get uh, a result which is completely compatible within the systematics. This, is, this was one of the cross checks that were shown. Right, but it's. Uh, you could look for the same effect using something that only did, for example, I'm asking you to comment really, because you could look for the same effect using something that only did mu. For question, then we stop, I think, because could we, uh, there could was we go no back end. To the, okay, so Bob first. Could we go back to the edge plot again? I hate to be type, ask a typecast question, but uh, so, so if I remember correctly from my uh, idiot al and uh, Fred James's book, if, if we idealize to a rectangular distribution, the uh, maximum likelihood estimate of the, of the location of the distribution just depends on the two extreme points, the average of the two extreme points or something like that. And so, in, in fact, it's hard to, for me to believe that your precision is coming from the... It's hard to, for me to believe that your precision is coming from the wiggles in the middle of the distribution. So I think we're close to the idealized case where it's, it's the edges that's giving you your precision. And therefore, the chi per, per degree of freedom, which is about one, using the whole distribution does not really indicate no. how good the fit is, where you're fitting. So if you just chop off the whole flattish part of the distribution and fit to those two tails, I think one will get a much better sense of, the, of how good the fit is. And, and, and the lower right curve doesn't look, you know, has a few points that are off, let's put it that way, but quantifying that, I think. Okay. Be, yes, we didn't put the numbers on the on the on the Pardon? slides. Pardon? We didn't put these numbers on the slides, but you're right. One could quantify it in terms of chi square in these regions, but uh, I do not remember the number by earth. I don't I, I don't have them on the slide. Okay. Just. Uh, just brought okay one more here okay yes. you haven't said much about supernova uh, data 
except that it's in the paper you mentioned that this is at 10 MeV, whereas you operate at 20 GeV. But you showed in your uh, systematic checks that there was no energy dependence in your data, but you sort of say that you reconcile the, with the supernova exclusion at 10 to the minus 9 by saying, yeah, but that was at 10 MeV. Is there a chance you can reproduce the experiment at a different energy, for example, or, or how do you cope with that? So how do we cope with that? This is a, a question related to the physics. Yeah, I think that we so are entering into <laughs> interpretation. I mean, yeah. as you have seen, they don't have the lever arm to do the energy dependence. They just yeah. show you that yeah. uh, there is no uh, obvious energy dependence, but that's all. I mean, yeah. uh, no, not cope philosophically, but you what? know, you say that you show your your. Show that we cannot claim an energy dependence within the accuracy of our measurement. Okay. Yeah. But by the way, then I, I think if we want to look at energy dependence, we should also look at these old uh, Fermilab data because they were yes. they were going up. They, although their accuracy was uh, uh, worse, they were going up to 200 GeV. So one should put all the points together. Uh, last word to GG, and, and then maybe the last the last last word Anton, Antonio would like I to say. Discuss all the discorrelation things that we were discussing with many questions. Would it be possible to take data? in the future with very, with, uh, very much bunched protons so that uh, you get them every five nanoseconds to answer to all these questions. Huh? Yeah. And also in that case, you could really show that you can communicate to Grand Sasso faster than the speed of light that you, you cannot do yet. Yeah, th th no, th that's a good uh, suggestion. In the future, we, we may think to play with the time structure of the beam. This is something that, for instance, uh, the people in the U.S. Uh, will do for the next measurement, for sure. I have another suggestion, which uh, before I give to Antonio. <laughs> Could one not bring a piece, you know, just one scintillator of the opera detector or something like that, and, and with the same electronics, put it at the end of the neutrino beam, use different GPS, so as if it was completely independent uh, experiment, and then you would, should find zero because I think you are really yeah. at, 100 me, uh, at one kilometer or less than a kilometer. Right, right. Would it be a possible, I mean, a cross-check of doing a near experiment yeah. where you should find zero? I mean, it's, a, it's a possibility to, to be investigated, yes. Okay. So, Antonio, I think the last one. No, first of all, I would like to say, following what Gigi just said, that uh, we, have, we are planning to, to continue the studies. Okay, this was a side analysis for us. Now it's becoming one of the main uh, issues. We should not forget that we still have to find uh, some tau events. And for this, <laughs> we would like to see that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, any, any discussion on the structure of the beam should not compromise the intensity. So this is clear. On the other hand, uh, I would say that on, on behalf of the collaboration, we are very grateful to all of you for all the stimulating questions of which we took note carefully, and we stored all the nasty questions and uh, suggestions, so thank you very much. And I would recommend you, just for those of you who not the opportunity to ask a question, to send me an email to me and saying that I was attending the meeting, I want to ask this question just to separate from the spam of uh, science fiction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so thank you very much on I behalf think, of Open. Okay, I think we should all really thank, uh, first of all, uh, congratulate the Opera collaboration and thank uh, uh, Dario, I mean, did a fantastic job. Thank <laughs> you.